Hello, my name's Roy Smith, and of course I'm a resident of Prescott now, but I'm from England. I spent most of my life guiding people in different parts of the world, in Africa. I was a mountain guide there. I ran a couple of expeditions for National Geographic in Africa and the Arctic. So I have a great love of travel, and especially traveling into places where not many people typically go. I like to go to unusual parts of the world, and, and, and that's where you really have your really travel adventures. So uh, we, we decided to go to Cuba about a year ago, and mainly on account of my friend Robert Miller, whose family lived in Havana. His grandfather lived in, in Cuba, in Havana, right through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and his father was a businessman in uh, Havana, but after the Castro Revolution, the Communist Revolution, in the late 50s, 1959, they left Cuba like a lot of Americans did who owned property there. Their property was taken over by the Cuban government. So for Bob, it was going back after a hiatus of almost 60 years to look at his country where he had grown up as a boy. So and my interest, of course, was to see a country looking at it through different eyes. Uh, I mean, Robert's experience was, of course, his family being dispossessed of all their possessions, their house, their businesses. And my perspective looking at is, well, you know, the communist uh, revolution uh, was there because of the ill treatment and the treatment of the people of Cuba by the Pat Batista regime and, and the, really the, the living conditions of most Cubans living in the countryside. So we were looking at it from very different perspectives. And uh, what we both agreed on, the revolution has occurred. It was 60 years in Kenya, in, um, in uh, Cuba, but now there's time for a change. Our party consisted of uh, Robert Miller and his wife, Tina, my wife, Brenda, myself, and George Yen, a businessman from Taiwan, whom Robert and I knew from when he was a student at Prescott College in the late 1960s. And we kept contact with uh, George and invited him to come along. And of course, he was delighted. He's a biker, and so he joined the team. So off we go to Cuba, this land full of expectations that we have. To what is it going to be like? I mean, you've, we read, of course, so much about Cuba from the right wing, the left wing, and now it was up to us to take a look at this land, which since 1959 has been run by, of course, the Castros, a communist country with authoritarian um, uh, government. So, Anyway, we, we, we uh, took an 18-hour bus ride from Havana, which is an extraordinary city. Everyone should visit Havana on account of its extraordinary architecture. And, of course, it's a World Heritage Site designated by the United Nations on account of its extraordinary architecture. So we took an 18-hour bus ride from Havana to a town called Barracoa, right on the eastern end of the island. And from there, our journey began on bicycles all the way heading back towards Havana. And what was the most fascinating part about, I think, about the journey was one, the absence of traffic on most of the rural roads. Very little traffic, that is, automobiles. We saw lots of bullocks pulling carts, horses with uh, carriages. The main form of taxi service in Cuba is horse and carriage. It's quite romantic, very practical, and you don't need, of course, an automobile. And the only automobiles, of course, that we saw were from the 19th, late 1940s and 50s. It was like a time warp going back to another world. And all these cars running around, most of them have diesel engines now, so they're getting the mileage out of them. And they're very courteous, because everyone in Cuba has a bicycle, because that's how most people get around. They don't have cars. Bicycles are the main form of transportation, or you take a horse taxi. The countryside is essentially rural. We would ride for hours and hours and hours through this beautiful rolling countryside, uh, no cars, no traffic, and just looking at this wonderful landscape. Initially, we, we, it was mixed farming country that we passed through, a lot of, um, what do you call, market gardens, farms, fruit, vegetables, and more and more, <clears throat> we came into the, the sugar fields. Uh, the main crop in 
uh, Cuba, of course, is sugar. A huge shot, uh, huge crop each year. And, uh, here, and, and then we'll see the bullocks pulling these cartloads of sugar along the, along the side of the road at a glacial speed of about three miles an hour. But anyway, that's the, the, the scene is quite extraordinary rural. Then all of a sudden, you come to a town. No suburbs, just a town. You leave the town and you're back in the countryside. We stayed in these wonderful bed and breakfast. They don't call them bed and breakfast. They call them casa particulars. And they're guaranteed or authorized by the government to essentially engage in private enterprise. This is the, the if you like, the spearhead of what of, of free enterprise, the free market economy that's going to happen in Cuba. This is going to happen, and it's going to happen a bit at a time, and it's the, these bed and breakfast places where people now are becoming entrepreneurial. They're wonderful. We lived in the houses of people. They would have two or three extra rooms, which they had upgraded with bathrooms, and we'd stay there, and in the morning come down to this stupendous breakfast, lots of fruit, piles of fruit, eggs and bacon, coffee, just wonderful, and $25 a night for accommodation. Now, where in the world can you go and get that? And of course, and have these extraordinary breakfasts. And some of the houses were very, very simple. One house, the chickens were running around the yard and the pigs were grunting in the pens behind the house. Uh, and then another house, uh, another place we stayed, the, the owners were kind of professional people, an economist and a sociologist. And they had the most wonderful, ultra-modern house with great paintings on the wall. And so there's a great contrast in the, in the houses we went into. But really, we're on a sightseeing tour of, of, of um, Cuba. And wherever we could, we would stop and find out what was going on. And this particular stop on our first day going over the mountains... Uh, the people came walking over to us and, and gestured, do you want some coconuts? And we said, well, yes. And they went up this tree, they saw these coconuts off, uh, brought them down, cut the tops off, and we're all drinking coconut juice for about 15 minutes. Just wonderful hospitality. They never said, this is how much it cost. They just gave it to us. They're just wonderful people. The spirit is quite extraordinary. We would often say to them, people, <clears throat> well, what is it like to live in Cuba today? What is it like? Because we're curious, we want to know. And very often the response was, well, you know, we, like, we love our country. We love our country, but we know things can be different. And they're aware that things are going to happen, and they're already thinking about it. And they say, you know, we know it can be better, and we're hoping for it. And they say, well, what is it like for you? And this one man who came to talk to us as we were sheltering under these trees, we got talking to him because Bob speaks fluent Spanish. And uh, we said, well, what are you doing? What, what, what do you do? Oh, he said, I used to be a peasant, but now I'm a guardian of the sugar fields. Because, you see, his status had improved on account of the revolution. He was no longer a peasant. He, his job was now to guard the sugar fields. We said, well, that's extraordinary. And we're talking to him, and another farmer came by with his bollocks, pulling a cart, and we started talking to him. And um, he said, well, you know, in Cuba, we have everything we need. No one starves in Cuba. No one goes hungry. We have ration books, and, uh, and which allocates, you know, basic uh, foodstuff to the population. Everyone gets enough. But he said, we have no money. We have nothing extra. We're just right on the poverty line. And I imagine in many ways it's probably much like the Depression era in America when people had maybe just enough, but they had nothing extra. And in Cuba, this is really uh, manifest because I'm looking at a photograph right now of where we stayed. And, and, and on the right-hand side of the street, you can see the place where we stayed, the bed and breakfast, and they've done it up. They obviously got some money from somewhere, probably from uh, Cuban friends who live in Miami who send money. On the other side of the street, it's like little Haiti. It's absolutely nothing has happened there for 60 years because they can't afford even to keep the up build, upkeep of their buildings. They can't afford the cement, they can't afford the paint, and so the buildings essentially 
slowly going downhill. Many are crumbling, but that, I believe, is going to change because now there's going to be an unrestricted flow of money from people in Florida, Cuban uh, people who left people who left Cuba after the revolution are now sending money back to Cuba and investing in Cuba. So that's the future. So what a journey, because I have hundreds of pictures and I'm just looking a few here to remind me of our experiences. And, you know, the common experiences, stopping the side of the road, no traffic, in the shade of trees and sitting down and having lunch and just gazing at the countryside. And every so many miles, you see these huge posters uh, at the side of the road put up by the, uh, the Castro regime. And this is what I'm looking at right now, and it, it shows uh, Castro and, uh, and Raul Castro, and they're saying, goodbye, Batista, essentially reminding the population that this is what happened 60 years ago. And in the main street, which is very interesting, you often see the older men, not all, only older men, but usually older men, sitting down playing dominoes. This is like the national game. <laughs> They're all playing dominoes. It's a wonderful game. And I used to play dominoes in the pubs in England when I was a young man. And we used to play the older guys. And whoever won had to buy the, uh, you know, one had, had to get the other guys to buy the beer. It was a great game. And this is going to a little village I'm looking at now, in, in somewhere in, on the road um, near... Um, near Guantanamo, actually, where the Americans have their base. It's a, and the cherry blossom is coming out. It's a beautiful scene. And, of course, the only traffic on the road is a, is a horse carriage. Oh, and we've got us and our bikes. And in the background, I think, is a 1948 Buick coming into view. Um, and this is... A, one of the highlights of the trip was our stay in Trinidad, which is, again, I, th I believe is, is a World Heritage Site. It's an extraordinary place on account of its architecture, a uh, beautiful place. And uh, we spent several days there talking to people and walking through different parts of the town. And I remember one of the questions someone asked me, we'll, so, we'll be so glad when you get back from Cuba, were you safe? I said, we never, ever felt unsafe anywhere. I said, you're more likely to get mugged in Miami waiting to get on the plane to Havana than you'll get mugged in Cuba. It's absolutely a very safe place. There's virtually no crime. I guess the punishment must be pretty harsh. Um, one of the things we saw a lot of in the cities were these schools, and uh, often the, the windows would be open to the streets so you could look inside the classrooms and see these young students studiously following their teacher's instructions. And the reminder is that the literacy rate in Cuba is higher than that in the United States. So they've done a remarkable job. In spite of communism, they've raised the literacy standards, so it's great in the United States. And of course, another aspect of Kenya, uh, oh, I keep saying Kenya, excuse me, of Cuba, is they have universal health care, something we are trying to get over here. We're not quite there yet. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, Cuba, of course, is a gem of the Caribbean, uh, and no sooner had the Spanish settled there, th and then the English and French pilots decided they'd like a piece of the action, so they're always <laughs> invading Cuba. In fact, the English took over Havana for one year, I think, in 16-something, uh, and took over the whole bloody uh, country, if you like, by, over, by taking over Havana, really taking over the country, and they opened trade, so it was quite a, a good move for Cuba at that time. But now, of course, the, um, it's a very different world. No one wants to invade Cuba anymore, although the U.S. Congress, after the communist invasion, uh, were very much for invading Cuba, but wiser minds prevailed, and that never happened. I'm looking at a picture now of the, of the, the, of the, uh, the Museum of the Revolution in Havana, and they've depicted some of the, who they see the worst characters uh, in, in their history. And it's really quite embarrassing as an American to look at this. So you just have to look at it and move along. You can't do anything else. But they start off on the left. You have that Batista, who, of course, the dictator, who ran off looting the, the country's money. Then they have Reagan, who apparently didn't seem to like. Then they have next to him George Bush Sr., and then finally, the last of the rebels, they have George Bush. And he's, he's depicted in a very poor light. I can't really explain it here. <laughs> I'm looking. Um, 
What is another remarkable thing is you're seeing all these cars on the road, you know, you don't see any garages like you see over here. And yet these cars have been running now for 50, 60 years. And you'll see, I'm looking at a photograph here of a picture I took of this fellow. He's just sitting on the sidewalk and he's got a part of his engine right here on the sidewalk and he's working at it. They say that Cubans can make something out of fresh air. And they're probably the best motor mechanics in the world because they make parts that they can't buy. You see, they can't get this stuff in the United States because of the trade embargo. And, of course, Havana was a beautiful place to be. And, uh, of course, the butcher's shop is where we'd often pass by in the morning as I walk into Havana and you've got a couple of huge pig heads slung up outside the shop here, and inside, of course, you buy the meat. None of it's refrigerated, it's just sitting there on the counter, and they have an axe and chop a piece off for you, and you walk home with a piece of meat under your arm. <laughs> it's another world. It's not quite as hygienic as we see in our own country. And Havana, once again, is a breathtaking place, and mainly on, on one of the architecture, and the people are so wonderful. And we caught this marriage going on here, and here's the bride and groom taking off in whatever car that is, something of the 1950s, off somewhere on a honeymoon. And uh, we're well looked after the entire time. Um, in Havana, we, we didn't spend much time there, but we did go and sit in the big hotels to get a sense of what it was like in the heyday of Havana when only the rich and famous went to Cuba. It was a kind of place you went away for the weekend and no one knew about it. And all kinds of things were going on there. And of course, the gambling was a big thing. And uh, we're sitting now where presumably in the years past, many people like... Um, Oh, I'm trying to think of the famous American uh, author. Um, <laughs> how could I? Hoke Hemingway. And, of course, he's well thought of in Kenya. But he was an absolute rogue. He was, a, he was a nice person, great literature, but an absolute rogue. He was probably sitting in some of these hotels we sat in, enjoying our lunches. Ah, what a world. What a world so different from our own. And um, it's a world I think everyone should go to and go soon rather than later before the big American invasion occurs because then it will be overwhelmed and it will start to change because American culture is, is popular, it's pervasive and people want to adopt it. And so go before the whole country's culture changes. Yeah, we, we cycle about 700, 800 miles, about 60 miles a day. That's a long way to bike, especially on some days when the temperature was in the 80s. But we would stop in the shade, have a drink, have a snack, try and engage some local Cubans to talk to them. And it was made the trip so exciting. It's the people. It's the people as much as the country that makes Cuba just an exceptional place. They're great artists, great musicians, and any time we went into a cafe, there was invariably a band playing. Great music. A little bit too loud for me, but I loved it. And what more can I say about this wonderful place? Right on our doorstep, a real gem. It's the pearl of the Caribbean. No question about it.